we go. Live from the UK's capital. Reaching out into other worlds. Alton Andrews. London tonight. We are controlling transmission. CO2 has had a very bad press in recent years. In fact, the word diabolical springs to mind, and that's particularly the case uh, where one's talking about <clears throat> fossil fuel burning, anthropogenic fossil fuel burning. Um, now, whatever you feel about the culpability of CO2, and whether it's guilty as charged, I think those of us that have been subject to uh, certain press reports, and I'm not looking at Sammy in particular, but uh, certainly people in this house have been subjected to quite a lot. So whether they feel that CO2 is culpable or not, they must have a certain sympathy for the way in which that particular gas has been maligned. Story, but trouble is we live in an age of belief systems and experts who give a theory and the theory must be right. In fact, these people are so arrogant, they believe their theories are better than nature itself. I tell you, nature is its own computer and works itself out better than anything I, Philip, or Peter, or all the global warmers put together can do. At the last minute, Mr Ed Miliband, who is now quite a distinguished politician, I gather, but was the minister in charge, put through an amendment which made Britain the first and only country in the world, as it still is, to be committed to cutting our carbon dioxide CO2 emissions by 80% in the next 40 years, by 2050. <coughs> the debate lasted six hours. Dozens of MPs spoke, and almost all of them accepted the belief, <laughs> which shows that the Almighty does have a very good sense of humour. <laughs> but this did not deter. <laughs> To 463 MPs of all parties voting for the bill, five were opposed to it, three voted against it, two were tellers. Their names should be written in gold. Sammy Wilson, why weren't you one of them? Where is Sammy? There he is, Sammy. <laughs> Sammy was one of the two MPs, the other being Peter Liddy, who questioned the need for that piece of legislation. Now, there were two astonishing things about that bit of legislation, two really astonishing things. One was the cost on government figures. They didn't sneak out the, f the real figures that they believed until a few months later. But basically, as you can see on the website of the Department for Energy and Climate Change, as it's now called, you can see that they believe that this Climate Change Act is going to cost the people of Britain up to £18.3 billion every year until 2050. And if you do a quick sum, that adds up to over £700 billion. But there's something actually even more astonishing about that day. Of all those 463 MPs who voted for that bill, there was, there was not a single one of them could have begun to explain how in practical terms we could cut our emissions of CO2 in this country by 80% in the next 40 years without closing down virtually the whole of our existing economy. That is a fact. You can believe, if you wish, that there is some magic technology as yet undiscovered which would enable us to do it, but as at the point where that act went through, and to this date, such a magic piece of technology hasn't been discovered, and therefore those MPs hadn't got the slightest idea, in practical terms, what they were voting for. I just want to say that uh, what we want to do today is make his presentation to Piers. He's proven his success. He's a man of principle. We're giving him today the Ernest Oates George Beck Award, as was mentioned earlier, for his quality of his work, his undying devotion to the cause of sceptic science, and he's transparently a man of integrity. Yes. So, please join with me for applauding this man. And he deserves, he deserves the Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Can I first of all welcome all of you? The Guardian has described you as the climate sceptic cabal. Um, <laughs> can I welcome you to the House of Commons? Uh, first of all, I think that um, we, we have listened today to the science. Um, Christopher said that he was bringing you down from the lofty heights of science.
to the uh, world of economics. I'm not going to maybe bring it down to the, the murky world of politics even <laughs> further. Um, but I don't think that we ought to be all that um, depressed about where the current situation is. Um, I think it's first of all, and when I look at it, when I was Environment Minister in Northern Ireland and, and, and first um, annoyed a lot of the climate change uh, sceptics, at that stage there wasn't even any consideration given to the fact that there might be an alternative view. That's why when an Environment Minister declared that he was sceptical, people gasped in awe. <laughs> that, you know, how could this be? The science is settled. Well, the science, no, no, no people are any longer saying that the science is settled. Now, in some, uh, uh, and politicians always benefit from this, of course, in some cases that's because the opposition has been so helpful to us by, as we have heard today, fraud, lies, cover-ups, etc., and then being caught on.